Talks on Book TV. You can see past programs and get our schedules at our websites. And you can join in the conversation on social media sites. Well, more debate is expected today on the Farm and Food Programs Bill. No agreement has been reached yet regarding amendments. And now live to the Senate floor here on C-SPAN 2. The Senate will come to order. The chaplain, Dr. Barry Black, will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. God, you are our God. Eagerly we seek you, longing to see your strength and glory. Today, Assure the members of this body of your love and give them unshakable confidence in your providential leading. Lord, teach them what they should think and do as you illuminate their path so that they will not stumble. As you have led this nation through troubled times in the past, be now to us our source of life and light and wisdom. Inspire us all so that we may know and do your will. We pray in your sovereign name. Amen. Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., June 14, 2012 to the Senate under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Tom Udall, a Senator from the State of New Mexico, to perform the duties of the Chair, signed Daniel K. Inouye, President Pro Tempore. Mr. President. The Majority Leader. I now move to proceed to Cal Number 250-S-1940. The Clerk will report. Motion to proceed to calendar number 250, S. 1940, a bill to amend the National Flood Insurance Act of 1968, and so forth, and for other purposes. Mr. President, following my remarks and those of Senator McConnell, if any, the next hour will be divided and controlled between the two leaders. They'll be equally divided. The majority will control the first half, the Republicans the final half. We're still working to try to finish an agreement on the farm bill so we can move forward. It's really disappointing we don't already have something, but hope is still here, and I hope we can get that done. A really important piece of legislation, but a few senators are holding this up, and that's too bad. I have agreed that we can have some amendments, and um, I had a nice colloquy on the floor yesterday with Senator Coburn, who's concerned about this bill and legislation generally. He indicated he thought it was a good idea to have a number of amendments and just start voting on them. So I hope we can get there. We can't do all 250 amendments that are out there, but we can do a lot of them. And let's see where we are. I hope we can get it done. Uh, we, on the flood insurance bill, we, can't, I have to, we have to get to that, Mr. President. The flood insurance expires at the end of this month. So we'll continue to work on agreement with the farm bill. I also hope to reconsider the failed cloture vote on the nomination of Maria Carmen Aponte to be ambassador to the Republic of El Salvador. We're going to do that as soon as possible. So votes are possible throughout today's session, as soon as we are notified when they're scheduled. Would the chair announce the business of the day? Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the previous order, the following hour will be equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees 
with the majority controlling the first half and the Republicans controlling the final half. Captain Corn, Mr. President. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Thaw.
President. S Senator from Rhode Island. Mr. President, may I ask that the pending quorum call be lifted? Without objection. Mr. President, last December, the Environmental Protection Agency finalized a rule called the Mercury Air Toxics Standard for power plants. This rule is important, and it was long, long, long overdue. Many Americans might not realize that before last December, there were no federal standards for mercury or the other toxic air pollution pouring out of our nation's power plants. 32 years ago, 32 years ago, Congress directed EPA to limit toxic air pollution from all big polluting industries. In response, EPA set standards for nearly 100 industries across our nation. However, until December, there were no such standards for the utility industry. The biggest source of mercury, arsenic, and other toxic air pollution in the country. Now, there are standards in place. Estimated to provide three to nine dollars of health and economic benefits for every one dollar invested in pollution controls. We should be celebrating this sensible yet significant public health achievement. Yet from the other side of the aisle, we only hear about the one dollar that the polluters have to spend to clean up. We never hear about the three to nine dollars that the rest of the public saves as a result of the pollution being cleaned up. We hear about the cost to the polluter all the time. We never hear about the cost, pick an asthma attack caused by soot and ozone. We never hear about the public health cost to all of us of the child having to go into the emergency room for an asthma attack. We never hear about the cost to the business of the mom who's not at work that day because she's off on a sick day taking care of that child in the emergency room. Or if she's working on a regular wage, maybe it's on her. Maybe she doesn't get paid for that day because she's in the emergency room with her child. We never hear about that cost. And how about the simple cost of a mother stuck in an emergency room with a child having a pollution-provoked asthma attack, waiting, anxiously, waiting for the nebulizer to kick in, waiting for that little oxygen meter on the child's finger to show that the oxygen levels are back where they should be. That's not even counted, the worry of a mom for her child having a pollution-caused asthma incident. But we never hear about that. We never hear about the dollar side. All they talk about, all we hear about from them, is the one dollar that the polluter has to pay to clean up their pollution. Never, in this case, the three to nine dollars. In other cases, it's 35 to one, over 100 to one. Instead, we have colleagues on the other side who want to halt this progress, notwithstanding the savings for virtually every American with a resolution that we're facing now that would void these new standards, standards that have just emerged after 32 years for the first time regulating toxic pollution out of utility plants. This resolution would not only void the new standard, but it would bar EPA from ever setting similar limits on power plants in the future. In speeches against these public health standards, one of my colleagues appears somewhat confused about the mercury air toxic standards. I'd like to set the record straight on two points. One, this colleague has complained that the technology does not exist to meet these standards. That's the complaint. The technology does not exist to meet these standards. But if you look at the Clean Air Act, it directs the EPA, as EPA did, to set these standards 
based upon the performance of the top 12% in the industry, the actual performance of the top 12% in the industry. In other words, at least one out of every eight power plant units must already be meeting each of the standards that is set. This isn't a case in which the technology does not exist. This is a situation in which one out of every eight plants is already meeting it. The technology assuredly exists, demonstrably exists. What EPA is doing is leveling the field so that utilities don't get competitive advantage by running dirtier power plants than their fellow utilities. This colleague has also complained that the rule establishes standards for toxic air pollution other than mercury. Well, limiting all toxic air pollution at once is more efficient for the utilities than tackling each pollutant separately. Frankly, if we were going at mercury once and then later arsenic and over and over the utilities had to go back and recalibrate, we'd be hearing complaints that that was the wrong way to do it. So if you do it all at once, they complain. If you do it separately, they would complain. The bottom line is, anytime polluters are act, asked to clean up their act, some people are going to complain. The uh, Section 112D of the Clean Air Act, Congress told EPA that they shall establish emission standards for each category of major sources of the toxic air pollutants listed in Section 112C. Congress provided a list of 180 pollutants, which EPA used as the basis for the power plant standards. You can't fault EPA for that. Moreover, the staggering health benefits of this rule, 4,700 fewer anticipated heart attacks, 130,000 fewer cases of children asthma symptoms, 5,700 fewer emergency room visits each year flow from limiting all toxic air pollution from power plants, not eliminating, limiting all toxic air pollution from power plants rather than just mercury. In pointing out that EPA correctly sought to limit all toxic air pollution from power plants, I do not want to gloss over the importance of setting those federal mercury standards. As I indicated earlier, power plants are the largest source of airborne mercury pollution in the United States. Mercury, as everybody knows, is a neurotoxin that can be most devastating to developing nervous systems. The reason we have the phrase mad as a hatter is because hatters use mercury in their work and it affected their brains. It is a neurotoxin. Exposure to mercury in utero or as a child can permanently reduce a person's ability to think and learn. For this reason, women of childbearing age, infants and children must avoid mercury exposure. What does this mean for Rhode Island? Many of you have heard me talk about the out-of-state air pollution that plagues my state. Most air pollution in Rhode Island is not generated from within our borders. It's sent from sources hundreds, even thousands of miles away. It is sent by power plants out of state in significant measure. On a clear summer day in Rhode Island, we'll be commuting into work. We'll hear on the drive time radio, today is a bad air day in Rhode Island. Infants, seniors, and people with respiratory difficulties should stay indoors today. Otherwise, a beautiful day, a summer day, when kids should be out playing. But if they have asthma, if they have a respiratory ailment, no. They're condemned to stay indoors, not because of anything that happened in Rhode Island, but because of out-of-state pollution, mostly from these power plants. So the same sources that create those bad air days for Rhode Island, that force seniors and infants, children, people with respiratory difficulties to stay indoors on an otherwise fine summer day, they also send us mercury pollution, which is why, although Rhode Island does not have a single coal fire generating unit within its borders, our health department has to issue fish advisories. Now, if there's one emblematic image uh, of American families doing something in the out of doors, it's a parent or grandparent taking their child, their son or their daughter, fishing. Norman Rockwell has captured this image. Many of us have 
similar images stored away in our childhood memories. And yet today, if a child goes fishing with her grandfather in Rhode Island, she cannot eat the fish she caught. The Rhode Island Department of Health warns that pregnant women, women thinking of becoming pregnant, and small children should not eat any freshwater fish in Rhode Island. The Health Department also warns these populations not to eat some saltwater fish, such as shark and swordfish, because they have high levels of mercury stored in their fat. The Health Department suggests that no one in Rhode Island should eat more than one serving of freshwater fish, not just women, children, women uh, who are pregnant. No one in Rhode Island should eat more than one serving of freshwater fish caught in our state each month in order to protect against mercury poisoning. Finally, the Health Department warns that no one should ever eat any of the fish caught in three bodies of water in Rhode Island, the Quidnick Reservoir, Winchek Pond, and Yorgoog Pond. For those of us who remember fishing as kids and eating what we caught, this is a sad state of affairs, and this is a state of affairs caused by polluters. And this cost of a family not able to go to Quidneck Reservoir, to Winchek Pond, to catch a fish, to take it home, to fry it up, to eat it, to do the things that are as American as apple pie in some respects, is because of the polluters. Would the senator yield at this point for a question? Of course. First, can I just thank you so much, so much, for taking to the floor today and explaining to everyone within the sound of your voice that we face a very important vote because we have a colleague on the other side of the aisle who wants to say to the Environmental Protection Agency, stop your work and allow polluters to continue to poison this atmosphere and those of us who live in it because you're talking about mercury. There's arsenic, there's lead, there's formaldehyde. And we have to say to the utilities, clean up your act. We're giving them enough time to do it. And I wanted to ask my friend a question, and then I will yield altogether to him. And the question is, is my friend aware that the cost-benefit ratio of this rule that Senator Inhofe wants to now repeal is nine to one? In other words, for every one dollar that we put in to make sure that this pollution goes away or is controlled, there's nine dollars of benefits in health. Is my colleague aware of that? Um, first of all, let me thank my wonderful chairman from the Environment and Public Works Committee for joining me on the floor and asking this question. The uh, figure that I've used, I've been more conservative. I've said that it's in a range between three and nine dollars, but there is a very, very significant payback. And as I was pointing out, that payback actually counts hard dollars to the public. It doesn't count things like, as I mentioned in my speech, the worry of a mom spending the day in the emergency room waiting for her child's breathing to recover. It may take into account her or her employer's economic loss. It doesn't take into account her worry. It doesn't take into account the grandfather not being able to take the fish home from Yogu Pond because it's now poisonous because out-of-state polluters have dumped mercury into the atmosphere and into the pond for so long. Those are real costs if you have a traditional American kind of family and people go fishing together and do things like that. You can't do that any longer. That doesn't even count in the equation. The polluters get to take that away from America for free in that equation. But as I said, What's interesting is that our friends on the other side only seem to think about, only seem to notice, only seem to talk about the one dollar that the polluters have to pay to clean up their act. They don't talk about the folks who get the jobs repairing the pollution, building the scrubbers, the American jobs that that creates. They just talk about the cost, and they don't talk at all about the cost on the other side, the health care costs, the job losses, the loss of education, the long-term health damage that people uh, undertake. And while I have you on the floor, Madam Chairman, let me tell you how proud I am of the job that you did yesterday on our bill, uh, on our highway bill. Getting out there with those big trucks and with the big heavy paving equipment was a wonderful way of demonstrating to the public what is happening here, which is that the most important jobs bill that the Senate has passed this year is being blocked by the House 
to eliminate or, dis or damage the summer construction season for highway work. In my state, as I think I've, I've told you, we have a, more than 90 jobs on the roster, 90 projects on the roster for this summer's highway construction season. 40 of them are falling off just because of the delay from March until June that the Republicans already forced on us. Now, as you've told me, they're trying to push for another delay that's going to knock more projects off, put more people out of work. Ours was a bipartisan bill. Couldn't have been more and better and more openly and transparently run by you and your ranking member, Senator Inhofe. It is 2.9 million jobs at stake. Everybody gets that our roads and highways need repair, and yet the Republicans, a group of Republicans in the House of Representatives, will not agree to go forward on this, and time is running out on this summer's construction season. They get the benefit of knocking down jobs in the run-up to the election, which I think is a really disgraceful way to go about the nation's business, but we can't move them. And the, the, the irony and the tragedy here is if Speaker Boehner would just call up this bipartisan Senate transportation bill, it would pass. It would pass with Republican votes and Democrat votes, and we could put people to work across this country right now doing the work that every American knows our highway system needs. This is not bridges to nowhere. This is bridges that people drive across to get to work. This is potholes and highways and places like 95 that goes through Providence on a viaduct, and it's falling in so much that they put planks underneath it to keep the pieces that fall through from landing on the Amtrak trains and the car traffic underneath. We need this work. We need these jobs. It is so disingenuous and so cynical to stop this work just because there's an election coming. And what you did yesterday to press on that was really important, and I appreciate that. I see uh, Senator Udall here, and I will yield the floor. Senator from Colorado is recognized. President, uh, I rise again today to continue the fight for our effort to extend the production tax credit for wind. I'm going to continue to return to the floor every morning until we get the PTC extended. It has a positive economic uh, effect on each and every one of our states, and we ought to immediately extend it. Uh, if we don't, there are tremendous risks uh, because there will be uncertainty. Uh, there will be uh, 37,000 jobs at risk, uh, per the estimate of the American Wind Energy Association, in 2013 if we let this important, crucial tax credit expire. On the other hand, looking at this positively, a recent study by Navigant concludes that a stable tax policy would allow the wind industry to create and save 54,000 jobs. That's a clear choice. Do we want to lose 37,000 jobs or do we want to create and save 54,000 more? Uh, over the last number of years in tough economic times, the wind industry has been a bright spot. We've seen growth in the wind industry and in the manufacturing side. And these are good paying jobs, but we're really at a make or break moment for wind energy. If we let the wind PTC expire, We'll lose thousands of jobs and billions of dollars in investment. We also run the real risk of losing our position in the global economic race for clean energy technology. Other countries are taking note. While we're dithering here in the Congress, our foreign competitors are literally eating our lunch. And I uh, am about to attend a Senate hearing in the Energy Committee on our competitiveness in the clean energy sector. And we're going to be discussing how China is outpacing us in the clean energy economy. And the witnesses I know will emphasize, because I've seen their testimony, that we've got to improve and maximize domestic manufacturing capacity or we risk losing these jobs to overseas competitors. I want to give an example this morning. In North Carolina, there's a company, PPG Industries. It's a fiberglass company, hundreds of employees. They've been threatened by foreign competition in the last few years. Fiberglass is a primary component of wind turbine blades, and the company has found new buyers in the wind industry. I want to quote the manager, Cheryl Richards, of this factory. She's urged us to act, and she said, quote, that's investment in the U.S. That's investment in jobs, in technology, in the future, in clean energy. 
If we're not doing it, there are people across the ocean who will, and they'll be happy to sell their products here. So while we can't get our act together in Congress to pass the Win PTC, our economic competitors in Europe and Asia have moved ahead. They've developed robust manufacturing capacity to serve both their domestic demands, and now they're beginning to sell all over the world. And just to emphasize how real this threat is, I want to show, show all the viewers and my colleagues what's happened in the past when the PTC has expired. Look back in 2000, there was a 93% drop. There was a 73% drop in 2001 to 2002. It just doesn't make sense. I hear this from Coloradans. I hear this from Americans. When project developers in the United States and American manufacturers are not receiving orders, and we could see another boom and bust cycle where you get a 73% or 93% drop in installations. Our economy doesn't need that, especially right now. So there's time for leadership here. It's time to show the American people that we can bridge partisan divides in the Congress, that we can act, and that we can take urgent action. Uh, let's get the WIND PTC reauthorized as soon as possible. It's within our power to stop sending jobs overseas, to prevent falling behind major economies like China, Germany, India, and to stop harming domestic industries and manufacturing. So again, look at this chart. This tells the story. We have to stand up and do the right thing. Let's start by passing the Win PTC extension now. We could do it today. I'm going to continue coming back to the floor of the Senate, Mr. President, until we get the Win PTC extended. And as my time begins to expire, I wanted to take a moment of uh, personal privilege and uh, note that uh, Thajil Shaw, uh, who's been working in my office as a fellow from the State Department, is leaving my office this week. She's returning to the State Department to continue doing her work there. I want to thank her for the phenomenal support she's given me, for the knowledge and skills she's brought to my office, and I wish her well in her efforts at the State Department. Mr. President, uh, with that, I yield the floor, and I note the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka. President, Senator from New Mexico, I would ask to uh, 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 vitiate the quorum call that's currently pending. Without objection. Thank you, Mr. President. And I would also ask uh, unanimous consent to speak for uh, five minutes as if in morning business. Without objection, Senator from New Mexico is recognized. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I for, or Mr. President, I also, uh, as my colleague Senator Whitehouse did, I want to thank Chairman uh, Barbara Boxer for her hard work and her leadership uh, to protect our air and our public health on this crucial vote that's going to come up later uh, this month. And I rise in opposition to the resolution of disapproval that we expect Senator Inhofe to offer. This resolution would permanently block the EPA from reducing mercury and toxic pollution from power plants in the United States. 
The standard is called the Maximum Achievable Control Technology Standard, or Utility MAC. By blocking this standard, this resolution is bad for public health. This resolution is also bad for America's natural gas producers. This resolution is especially bad for electric utilities that did the right thing and followed the law. Environmental protection should be a bipartisan issue. Republicans and Democrats both passed the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, and other environmental laws by wide margins. I urge both parties not to support this resolution. Here are some key points on the public health issues that are before us when this resolution comes to the floor. The Environmental Protection Agency estimates this standard will save 4,000 to 11,000 lives per year by reducing toxic pollution. The EPA also estimates this standard will prevent nearly 5,000 heart attacks and 130,000 childhood asthma attacks. Mercury is a powerful neurotoxin. It is mostly a threat to pregnant women and young children. We took lead out of gasoline. We can also take mercury out of smokestacks. Like many Westerners, and I know the, the gentleman, uh, uh, preside, the presiding officer, I enjoy, we both enjoy fly fishing. In too many areas in America, we have mercury advisories for fish from American lakes and rivers. In New Mexico, most of our streams are under mercury advisories, which means pregnant women and children cannot eat the fish from those streams. You cannot really put a price on healthy children, but if you try, this rule produces tens of billions of health benefits each year. This resolution of disapproval could permanently block these benefits. I would also like to talk about the impact of this resolution on natural gas. Natural gas has much, much lower toxic emissions than coal. It has no mercury. It has no soot, known as particulate matter. Recent discoveries of U.S. natural gas have led to a 100-year supply. Natural gas prices are low, and while that is actually bad for New Mexico's economy in some places, it's good for consumers. Natural gas is increasing its market share in the power sector from 20 percent to 29 percent recently because it is a, it is a lower cost and cleaner fuel. EPA standards do not ban coal, but they do call on coal to compete on a level playing field and reduce its pollution. If we pass this resolution, we'll, we will inject further uncertainty into the utility sector, which is balancing its portfolio to more equal shares of coal and gas as opposed to being overly reliant on coal. I support research in defining ways to clean up coal. If we put our minds to it, we may be able to take out the toxic pollutants. I see the gentleman from Arizona is on the floor. I first just want to thank him for allowing me a couple of minutes here to, to get my statement in. I would ask unanimous consent that my entire statement be put into the record. Without objection. And I would yield, uh, yield the floor and, and uh, if the once Senator again, from thank Mexico Senator McCain. If desires a few extra minutes, I'd be more than happy to yield. The, well, thank you. Thank you very much, Senator McCain. And I, I will, uh, I'll take one more minute here to just finish this, uh, finish this off. Uh, and finally, I, I would like to note that this resolution is a bailout of companies who would rather spend money on lobbying than on pollution controls. The EPA standard does not harm responsible coal companies. It is achievable with current technology. It's my understanding that most or all of the coal plants in New Mexico have already, already have the technology to meet these standards. Public Service Company of New Mexico has invested in mercury controls to reduce pollution in our state. Many other utilities have as well across the nation. A variety of business groups support EPA's mercury standard, including the Clean Energy Group of Utilities, the American Sustainable Business Council, and the Main Street Alliance. These standards are required by the Clean Air Act 
If we block them, we will punish the law abiders and bail out the procrastinators. I urge my colleagues to oppose the resolution of disapproval. And once again, I thank uh, Senator McCain from Arizona, and I yield the floor. Mr. President, Senator from Arizona. Mr. President, uh, I note that the President uh, residing in the chair was paying close attention to the Senator from New Mexico. I think that's entirely appropriate uh, for that uh, to happen, and I'm, <coughs> I'm sure that it is, uh, certainly has nothing to do with family allegiance. Uh, the Senate is considering the Farm Bill, which we do every five years. Uh, during this debate, Americans will hear speeches about spending reductions and cuts to farm subsidies, and I concede that there's some of that in this bill. Unfortunately, so far we fail to have an open and fair amendment process that's <clears throat> that should be the case in the United States Senate. I have several amendments that I would like to have considered, and like my other colleagues, we've been prevented from doing so. I've been in this body for some years in consideration of previous farm bills, and I've always been able to have a couple of amendments considered and voted on. Unfortunately, that doesn't seem to be the case in this consideration of this farm bill. It's very regrettable. It's very unfortunate that we can't just start voting on amendments and then see where we are. Instead, we have the filling of the tree and uh, other language that most Americans have no idea what we're talking about, but really does prevent uh, this body from considering the amendments of uh, members on both sides of the aisle. It's unfortunate. Also, the fact remains that the programs authorized under this Farm Bill consume a colossal sum of taxpayers' dollars. This bill is over 1,000 pages and estimated it costs 900 and $69 billion over 10 years. $969 billion over 10 years. <clears throat> That's about a billion dollars per page. It's a 60% increase from the previous farm bill that was passed in 2008. And I believe it's necessary to assist low-income families with nutrition programs. We should keep our farmers out of the red when a natural disaster strikes. But I'm also mindful the taxpayers are saddled with a $1.5 trillion deficit and a ballooning $15 billion trillion dollar national debt. The Farm Bill is ripe for spending cuts. Some have taken place, not nearly as are necessary. And as usual, a Farm Bill, <clears throat> being 1,000 pages long, is filled with special deals for special interests. I acknowledge the Senate bill generates $23 billion in savings, and that's a notable economy, uh, accomplishment. We've finally done away with Depression-era farm subsidies like direct payments and the counter-cyclical program, which encourages overproduction, thereby triggering more farm subsidies to compensate for depressed prices. Unfortunately, it seems that Congress' idea of a farm bill reform is to eliminate one subsidy program only to invent a new one to take its place. Cutting direct and countercyclical payments actually saved the taxpayers about $50 billion. Rather than plug the money into deficit reduction, the Farm Bill blows $35 billion of its own savings on several new subsidy programs. For example, we have a new Agricultural Risk Coverage Subsidy Program, or ARC, which works by locking in today's record high crop prices and guaranteeing farmers up to an 89% return on their crop. ARC could cost taxpayers anywhere from $3 billion to $14 billion each year, depending on market conditions. We also create a, create a new $3 billion cotton subsidy program called STACS that the Brazilian trade representatives have signaled will escalate their WTO anti-dumping complaint against the United States. I wonder how many of our taxpayers know that we already pay Brazil $150 million a year to keep our cotton programs. Why would we make things worse? This bill authorizes the creation of a new marginal loss 
subsidy program for catfish. This bill maintains the $95 billion federally backed crop insurance program, which also subsidizes crop insurance premiums. We then pile on a new $4 billion program called Supplemental Coverage Option, SCO, that subsidizes crop insurance deductibles. Subsidized insurance, subsidized premiums, and subsidized deductibles. I'm hard pressed to think of any other industry that operates with less risk at the expense of the American taxpayer. This is all part of farm politics. In order to pass a farm bill, Congress must find a way to appease every special interest of every commodity association from asparagus farmers to wheat growers. If you cut somebody's subsidy, you give them a grant. If you kill a grant, then you cover their insurance programs. Let's take a look at several other handouts that special interests have reaped into this year's farm bill, which may account for the size of the bill. Fifteen million dollars to establish a new program, a new grant program, fifteen million dollars to establish a new grant program to, quote, improve the U.S. sheep industry. We're going to spend $15 million, your taxpayers' dollars, to improve the U.S. sheep industry. The bill authorizes $10 million to establish a new USDA Department of Agriculture program to eradicate feral pigs. I've always been against pork spending, but now we're going to spend $10 million to establish a new USDA program to eradicate feral pigs. $25 million to study the health benefits of peas, lentils, and garbanzo beans. $25 million to study the health benefits of peas, lentils, and garbanzo beans. I know that mothers all over America that have advocated for their children to eat their peas will be pleased to know that there is a study that's going to cost them $25 million to study the health benefits of peas, lentils, and garbanzo beans. $200 million for the value-added grant program, which gives grants to novelty producers like small wineries, and I'm not kidding, the occasional cheesemaker. $40 million in grants from the U.S. Department of Agriculture to encourage private landowners to use their land for bird watching or hunting. Now we're looking at a $1.5 trillion deficit this year, and we're going to spend $40 million to encourage private landowners to use their land for bird watching or hunting. I'm all for bird watching. I support hunters, not to the tune of $40 million. $700 million for agriculture and food research initiative. $700 million for agriculture and food research initiative, which funds a variety of research grants, like testing pine tree growth in Florida, or studying moth pheromones. I have no clue what a moth pheromone is. When did it become a national priority to study moth pheromones? $250 million for the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Urban Forest Assistance Program, which spends federal funds to plant trees in urban parks and city streets. A new program that spends $125 million to promote healthy food choices in schools. Now, there are already at least four, four other healthy eating education programs in this bill already. There are already four, so we're going to add another $125 million program for another healthy eating education program. $200 million for one of my all-time favorites, which is the Market Access Program, which uh, has been there for years, which subsidizes overseas advertising campaigns of large corporations. We have, of course, the infamous mohair wool subsidy, which has been fleecing the American people since 1954. When Congress passed the 1954 Farm Bill, they wanted to ensure a domestic supply of wool for military uniforms by paying farmers to raise, among other things, 
and gore goats for mohair. This may have held merit then, but nobody today can dispute that mohair became obsolete thanks to synthetic fibers. Today we use mohair in custom socks, fashionable scarves, and trendy throw rugs. Some of my colleagues may recall that Congress killed off mohair subsidies in the 1990s. Unfortunately, goats are reputed to eat just about anything, and our hard-earned tax dollars are no exception. By the time Congress passed the 2002 Farm Bill, mohair subsidies had been restored. The mohair program, which costs taxpayers about a million dollars a year, may not be particularly expensive compared to most farm programs. I suppose where some of my colleagues see a minor government pittance for wool socks. This is a disgraceful example of how special interests can embed themselves in a farm bill for generations. As if field corn and ethanol subsidies weren't nefarious enough, this farm bill includes a new carve-out for popcorn subsidies. I'm not making it up, popcorn subsidies. This is a perfect example of farm bill politics. Thanks to a provision snuck into a 2003 appropriations bill, popcorn start, started receiving millions of dollars in direct payment subsidies. However, because the new farm bill eliminates direct payments, the popcorn industry is scrambling to be added to the newly created ARC program. Under this farm bill, popcorn will be subsidized to the tune of $91 million over 10 years, according to CBO. The cooking oil that movie theaters use to heat popcorn is already subsidized, as well as the butter they put on top. So popcorn is doing fine, is the truth of the matter. The price of cop popcorn has risen 40% in recent years, thanks in part to ethanol and recent free trade agreements with Colombia and South Korea, are creating a boom for American popcorn exports. There isn't a kernel of evidence that they need this support from taxpayers. The Farm Bill Sugar Program is another masterful scam. The USDA operates a complex system of import tariffs, loans, and government production quotas that restrict sugar imports and keep sugar prices artificially high. The sugar barons will tell you that the Department of Agriculture Sugar Program operates at, quote, no net cost to the American taxpayers because sugar didn't receive direct payments. In actuality, businesses and consumer bear the burden of the sugar program by paying higher costs for any sweetened product. Every year, American consumers are forced to pay an extra $3.5 billion on sweetened food products. Just yesterday, the Senate voted to table an amendment to phase out the sugar program, which is a sweetheart for sugar growers deal for sugar growers. Finally, Mr. President, one of my favorites of all time is the catfish. I have an amendment which would repeal a farm bill provision that directs the USDA to create a new fat catfish inspection office. I'm grateful for the support of my colleagues who have co-sponsored the amendment. What we're attempting to do with this amendment is simple. The amendment puts an end to the latest attempt by southern catfish farmers to restrict catfish imports. Five years ago, a protectionist provision was snuck into the 2008 Farm Bill that requires the Department of Agriculture to begin inspecting catfish. As my colleagues know, the USDA inspects meat, eggs, and poultry, but not seafood. Thus, a whole new government office is being developed at USDA just to inspect catfish. Catfish farmers have tried to argue that we need a catfish inspection office to ensure Americans are eating safe and healthy catfish. I wholeheartedly agree that catfish should be safe for consumers. The problem is FDA already inspects catfish just as it does all seafood, screening, screening it for biological and chemical hazards. If there were legitimate food safety reasons for having USDA inspect catfish, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Don't take my word for it, just ask USDA. When the Department of Agriculture completed an internal assessment for the program in December 2010, the department said it could not establish a rational relationship between the catfish office and the risk to human health, concluding, quote, there is substantial uncertainty regarding the actual effectiveness 
of the catfish inspection program. The Department of Agriculture estimates, estimates that this questionable program will come at a cost to taxpayers, $30 million to create the office and $14 million each year thereafter. The Government Accountability Office has also extensively examined the catfish office. In February 2011, GAO re released a report saying the catfish office is at high risk for fraud, waste, and abuse, and that it's duplicative of FDA's functions and would fragment our food safety system. Just last week, GAO issued a new report simply titled, quote, responsibility for inspecting catfish should not be assigned to the U.S. Department of Agriculture and called upon Congress to repeal the catfish office. This isn't the first time consumers have been hoodwinked by southern catfish farmers. When the Senate considered the 2002 Farm Bill, they slipped in an obscure, obscure provision that made it illegal to label Vietnamese catfish as catfish in the United States. At that time, the State Department had recently reopened trade relations with Vietnam, and domestic catfish farmers in southern states found themselves competing against cheaper catfish imports. Domestic catfish farmers wanted to discourage American consumers from buying Vietnamese catfish by marketing under its Latin name, Pungaceus, or Panga, even though it's virtually indistinguishable from U.S. grown catfish. The labeling law was enacted. It ultimately backfired on catfish farmers because they remain popular with American consumers. It's a senseless law, and my colleagues may recall that I came to the floor to fight against it. I asked the question, when is a catfish not a catfish? Why would Congress pass a law that renames a species of catfish into something else? Why would we single out catfish and put it in the same category as USDA inspected beef? Ironically, catfish farmers are lobbying USDA to re-relabel Vietnamese panga back to catfish to ensure Asian imports are subject to this new catfish office. So, the catfish offers, offer, office offers no legitimate food safety benefit. Its true goal is to erect trade barriers on Asian catfish imports to prop up the domestic catfish industry and make American consumers pay more. So, Mr. Mr. President, the uh, farm bill before us is, has some laudable parts to it. There are some reductions in spending. But when we examine the bill, we find more and more of these kinds of special interests, pork barrel, uh, unnecessary spending, and programs that either are protectionist in nature, programs that have been inserted sometimes in the past in the middle of the night, and we have just begun to examine a number of provisions in this bill which I did not discuss today. Mr. President, I wish that the small business men and women in my state had a bill for small business, a bill that would help them in the very difficult times that they are ex experiencing, in the terrible economic times which have caused them to not be in business anymore, and they and their families going through the most difficult times. So this bill obviously is one that is well-intentioned, but I also think in these harsh economic times, it is far, far from the kind of legislation that we owe the American people. Mr. President, I yield before I suggest the absence of a quorum. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Kaka.